All right, now we're gonna need a little space again. Let's keep on expanding. And in this section, we're going to see SMI handler implementation bugs. There's gonna be multiple categories and there's gonna be a whole bunch of defensive mechanisms. I'm gonna be adding this bar here for defensive mechanisms that are common to the various implementation bugs and a bar here for a bunch of privilege reduction options that are available for everyone. But yeah, this is gonna be you know a lot of defensive options, but that also just means a lot of work for defenders if they wanna actually stop this kind of thing. So the key point here is that there can be all sorts of different implementation bugs, but again, through the, you know, looking at the different research that's come out over time, we can categorize some of them into a couple of buckets. So this is the first bucket, callout vulnerabilities. So the idea is that SMRAM is supposed to be this isolated area that you know no attacker can breach and get into, but if you have something like a call assembly instruction in there that is taking a memory address, and that memory address is outside of SMRAM, well, then that means an attacker can just you know rewrite the memory address outside of SMRAM and point it wherever they want to attacker shellcode. That code will run in the context of a CPU that is in SMRAM or SMM, and consequently that code will be effectively the most privileged CPU execution code. So the ITL folks found this back in 2009. There was also a random bug track post in 2009 by a person who pointed this out in some ASUS systems. In 2010, the French researchers started pointing out the same kind of problems of you know, jumping or calling outside of SMRAM. And they actually made a distinction between, you know, just calling directly outside or fetching a, a function pointer from outside. I don't make the distinction. I just say either way, it's uh, calling out of SMRAM. Now, it was interesting as I was digging back through the research to see this, they were covering a summary of the various attacks that were known at the time, circa 2010, and they had outlined a interrupt descriptor table uh, register based attack and they said they hadn't actually proved it exploitable. So there you go, go read that research and see if you can find a way to make it exploitable. You, there's a free little research opportunity for you. Then circa 2015, Corey and me had started finding these kind of vulnerabilities as well. I wanted to call them incursion vulnerabilities because I like naming stuff after Marvel things. And this is what it's like when worlds collide! SMM and not SMM coming into conflict. Basically, it was a situation where, you know, Corey was off finding vulnerabilities in SMM, and unfortunately, I had to break it to him after he found them. I was like, I'm pretty sure this is the same class of bug that, you know, Invisible Things Lab found back in 2009. Anyways, by the way, this is Black Panther, not uh, Batman. Hopefully, you know, folks recognize that now. I know you don't normally see him with a cape in the MCU, but that's Black Panther. Anyways, so exactly the same thing, just typical SMM reaching outside of SMM, and that's a vulnerability. You can write Ida Python, you know, scripts in order to find a whole bunch of these kind of vulnerabilities. So then after we published that research, another researcher went off and, you know, decided to reverse engineer uh, the Lenovo systems that had listed themselves as patched. And so he wrote a blog post specifically on uh, reverse engineering and finding the vulnerability and then exploiting it. And then later on, he went off to find his own vulnerability and found a novel one and posted a zero day for how to exploit it. Okay, so now I'm going to introduce a common bus here for different offensive capabilities that are going to apply to this to different uh, SMI handler implementation bugs. So the first one is just audit the code. Of course, auditing the code should be able to find these kind of vulnerabilities. So what else can you do? Well, one of the oldest capabilities to try to deal with SMM exploits was a thing called SMI Transfer Monitor. It's basically jailing SMM inside of a VMM. Now, this was first brought to light when Invisible Things Lab started attacking Intel Trusted Execution Technology. And they basically found that it seemed to be the case that if they broke into SMM, then they could just automatically and guaranteed defeat the security guarantees of TXT. And so Intel told them that the solution for that was a thing called the STM, SMM Transfer Monitor, or SMI Transfer Monitor. It's referred to as both things in the Intel documentation. And the basic idea was, again, you just take a virtual, mach virtual machine management system and you wrap SMM in it. And then the idea was if the operating system is virtualized as well, then there needs to be some sort of communication between the STM and the VMM to you know, agree on you know, what 
areas of memory are restricted and reserved and so forth. What is SMM allowed to reach out into? For instance, maybe there's a communications buffer that is directly uh, needed to transfer information from an operating system into SMM, and it shouldn't be able to get access to anything else. And then here's my little color commentary from my book on uh, Intel Safer Com Computing Initiative 2006. I was reading this probably around 2008, 2009, something like that. Must have been 2009 because it would have been after uh, after Invisible Things Labs. And it was funny because basically they're talking about, you know, how the protections work. And they said, you know, STM is one of the things that helps protect the physical pages. But that's a gap because nobody actually had STMs. Nobody was using STMs at the time. So it's obviously very complex to wrap all of system management mode in a VMM. And furthermore, it's not exactly clear, you know, what the communication and negotiation should be between VMMs and STMs about, you know, who gets access to what memory and so forth. So the reality is that basically no one was using uh, STM. There was an initiative by some NSA researchers on the defensive side of the house who understood that STM was fully required to have secure systems, and so they tried to get STMs in use and things like that, but uh, to no avail effectively. Eventually, Intel released a, a reference implementation in 2015 and uh, opened up the documentation that was previously confidential. So that's one approach, which is the mitigation of privilege reduction of system management mode. Basically, if you wrap it in a VMM, then that means the VMM, the STM, is going to be able to restrict all of the physical memory that it has access to, and that would be a useful privilege reduction. What else can you do to try to make it so that a system management mode compromise is not as bad? Well, starting around the uh, fourth generation core series or so, Intel added in this MSR, S MSR SMM feature control, and it has a bit inside of it that basically acts like SMAP for SMM, meaning that if SMM tries to execute code outside of the range that is covered by SMRRs, which will effectively be considered the de facto SMM range, if it tries to execute outside of there, that'll cause a machine check error. And so basically SMM calling out of its you know little constrained area of memory will cause an error. So that would be good as well. So what's another thing that we can do to try to deal with SMM callout vulnerabilities? Well, we can use some software-only mechanisms, such as installing page tables that are read-only. So we said that when you get into SMM to start with, it looks very much like 16-bit real mode. And then typically, the software is going to transition itself into 32 or 64-bit protected mode. Now, within that protected mode, they're going to want to use some sort of page table. And if the BIOS, when it set up the initial code, makes it so that those page tables are self-referential and they indicate that the page table itself may not be written to, then that's going to make it that much harder for an attacker to change the memory ranges which the page tables have mapped into SMM. Also, you can use some of the typical exploit mitigation things like setting the execute disable bit on data pages for any sort of you know stack or heap, anything like that that's used inside of it. Any global data should also be marked read-only. And the code should also be you know marked as non-writable. It says read-only here, but of course you're going to want to have it executable. So executable, XOR, writable, so non-writable. And so taken together, these sort of things help restrict the physical memory that SMM is able to access, and that helps deal with this notion that if SMM was broken into, that it could just scribble all over operating systems and VMMs. And so these sort of changes are contributed to EDK2, the EFI Development Kit 2, which is sort of the reference uh, skeleton for building UEFI systems. So that means that, you know, third-party vendors, IBVs, OEMs, uh, they could be using these to help uh, restrict SMM significantly. Now, Intel recognized that just making page tables read-only and things like that was insufficient. There were still opportunities for privilege escalation. And so they started introducing new hardware changes around 2018. Uh, coincidentally enough, about three years after when, you know, researchers had started finding all sorts of SMM vulnerabilities. So these new hardware mechanisms have CR0, CR3, SMBase. These are things that if an attacker could manipulate, that would allow them to gain arbitrary code execution in the context of SMM. It makes it so that these can be locked down so that even SMM itself is not able to change these. 
So CR3, for instance, that points at the page tables, right? We learned that in Architecture 2001. If an attacker can find, you know, some sequence of instructions would allow them to write to CR3, then that whole software-only page table protection mechanism wouldn't be useful. But if the code has locked down CR3 so that even if they find such a, you know, sequence, it won't actually write to CR3, then that'll make it that much harder for them. So that would be another defensive mechanism, again, reducing the privilege of uh, SMM by basically saying these things that it should otherwise be able to do, like changing these control registers, it is not able to do anymore. Yet another thing, starting in 2020 hardware, is that they will effectively restrict the privileges of most of the SMM code to be ring three. So the entry point may start at ring zero, and the entry point is actually going to be provided by Intel. So Intel now provides a sort of entry binary that deal, which utilizes these uh, hardware protection mechanisms and importantly utilizes a measurement technology that we'll talk about in a second. So Intel provides a basic uh, binary blob to say this is the entry point to SMM. And then the expectation is that blob will, you know, transition privileges so that the OEM SMI handler, so, you know, Dell, Lenovo, HP, whoever has an SMI handler, that code is going to run as ring three. So now if that thing gets compromised, uh, it will not be able to, any other things that, you know, control registers, any other port IO, any other stuff that uh, it shouldn't otherwise have access to uh, will now be restricted away from that. Now, you know, this is pretty new technology, and, you know, the real question is who, if anyone, is using this at this point, but, uh, but that's an interesting thing to go investigate, right? So that's the other defensive mechanism, deprivilege the main body of the SMM code by making it ring 3 instead of ring 0. What else can we do? Well, we talked about the problems with STM, and we said, you know, STM uh, wasn't really in use. You know, even once there was a reference implementation, there just wasn't, you know, enough demand from people other than NSA saying we need this. Uh, and so consequently, it's not really in use. Now, the fact that the lack of STM would leave TXT vulnerable meant that this important technology, TXT, which is now subsequently being used for things like Windows Secure Launch, uh, it had this architectural hole. And so you have, you know, a couple of options, either A, everyone in the world has to adopt STMs, which clearly isn't happening, or B, Intel had to introduce new hardware capabilities to plug the SMM hole in TXT while not requiring a full-fledged STM. And so this PPAM, Platform Properties Assessment Module, is effectively a STM light. It's not trying to virtualize the system. It's not trying to deal with the uh, constraints to, you know, deprivilege the thing, but it is trying to make it so that the measurement capability that already existed in TXT is effective. And so, uh, you know, system makers can have some trust that this launched environment that TXT launches that's supposed to be dynamic root of trust, which means you just pop a little trusted environment into existence and you have to have some belief that, you know, the system behaves in a way that you can trust it. Well, PPAM gives you the ability to provide a more trustworthy measurement capability that was otherwise subverted by SMM before. So overall, you know, this is described in the same document as those other, you know, hardening mechanisms. It seems to me to be, you know, a lot more tractable in that it's just doing measurement of the code. It's not trying to jail everything. And because Intel provides this stuff, it should be easier for vendors to pretty much just drop it in. Also, Microsoft is pushing this as a thing that they really want because basically at this point they've kind of given up on securing the entire firmware ecosystem and they just say, I want to be able to use TXT, I want to be able to securely launch my VMM for, you know, Windows virtualization based security and everything besides that, you know, they don't care. So this is a interesting capability. And, you know, the fact that Intel is providing this hardened SMI entry point uh, means that, you know, IPVs hopefully can't mess it up. So that is a detection mechanism. So this would not deal directly with the prevention of callout vulnerabilities. It would only deal with if someone exploited a callout vulnerability, if they got themselves into SMM, then this PPAM mechanism should provide a way to trust that the overall architecture of TXT is capable of measuring SMM. And if there's a bad guy there, then it should 
uh, you know, change the measurements. And if you have anything uh, in those measurements that, sorry, if you have anything restricted behind those measurements, such as a, you know, full disk encryption uh, decryption key, then you wouldn't decrypt once the SMM is infected and you would only decrypt if it was uninfected. So all in all, you know, having read through that paper recently, it made me think very much, you know, I should buy a Comet Lake to attack. But then I thought to myself, no, you should buy a Comet Lake to attack. Why should I hog all the glory? This is a research opportunity for you. Basically, go out, read how this works, you know, go find, you know, sign the NDA, get access to the proprietary documentation, or don't, and then go out and see how this works, analyze any uh, BIOS vendors who say that they're using Microsoft Secure Launch, and, you know, see whether they're using this. What, if any of these pieces, are they using? What, if any, vulnerabilities like SMM callouts do they still have?